good afternoon everyone uh, welcome you for the fourth uh, webinar series of department of uh, history today we have very distinguished and you know influential personality professor uh, mahesh rangarajan uh, he will be speaking on uh, natures of past history ecology and society in india we are uh, so grateful uh, to you know uh, professor mahesh rangarajan for accepting our uh, uh, invitation you many of you you know know him personally as well as uh, through his work um, his is is uh, i think uh, uh, main authority on uh, ecological studies and you know nature studies so i request uh, my uh, uh, colleague uh, dr vijay ramdas to introduce uh, professor mahesh rangarajan or to uh, vijay uh, thank you professor bangya uh, hello everyone welcome to the webinar series uh, here is a little uh, brief summary of uh, professor mahesh rangarajan's background professor mahesh rangarajan studied at delhi university at the university of oxford uh, he is presently professor of history and environmental studies at ashoka university uh, sonipet haryana uh, previously he taught at the universities of cornell jadavpur and delhi uh, professor mahesh rangarajan was also the director of the nehru memorial museum and library between 2011 and 2015 his first book fencing the forest was published in 1996 and the most recent nature and nation uh, in 2015 professor rangarajan's other works include the oxford anthology of indian wildlife published in 1999 and environmental issues in india published in 2007 his co-edited works include nature without borders published in 2014 and shifting ground in the same year and most recently at nature sage in 2018 professor mahesh rangarajan was also associated in the eps with two journals uh, first one is environment and history founded late professor richard grow who passed recently uh, this environment and history journal currently published by the white horse press uh, at cambridge uh, uh, it was founded in 1995 Uh, in collaboration with mahesh rangarajan and richard grow and conservation and society that is other general uh, mahesh took initiative uh, in founding this journal in 2003 uh, he was chair of the elephant task force instituted by the government of india in 2010 he is also associated with the ashoka archives of contemporary india set up within ashoka university 3 uh, years ago In today's talk, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan will be speaking on ecological developments in India from the lens of history. Uh, here is the summary given by Mahesh Rangarajan: Net past as contested as the present. Yet, even as what we do or not meant by nature differs and changes over time. Histories of the environment also grapple with change, changing material realities. India's place in the natural world may be quite as critical as its political and economic importance today. India is home to not only a billion plus humans, but also over 500 species of mammals and a thousand each of fish and reptiles and 25,000 uh, flowering plants. Making spaces with and for nature looms large in today's debate. At the same time, keeping our living environment safe from epidemic diseases like you know current crisis of ongoing crisis of covid-19 or disasters such as floods or cyclones or droughts is as critical as understanding history and environment in relation to contemporary politics state society and nature have now been subject of serious inquiry for decades drawing on new books and his own research in today's talk Professor Rangarajan will try to pose questions that are uh, perhaps vital to uh, uh, this enterprise. After all, knowing the present needs us also to ask how we came to be where we are today. Uh, what would you, Professor Mahesh Rangarajan? Uh, 
thank thank you thank you thank you professor vijay ramdas and thank you uh, colleagues uh, it's a great privilege to be back in hyderabad university i was uh, in the university 5 years ago and we were just discussing it was a very different time one could after the talk go and have a cup of coffee walk around the campus and uh, absorb a lot of the very beautiful sights of birds animals and trees while discussing issues with the students with the faculty with other friends who had managed to make it one plus of course of the virtual world is there are many people like me today who are unable to travel to the very lovely campus of ashoka university and uh, because of the very fine initiative taken by the department of history we are able to gather here today just think about some of the issues which have come up in the newspapers in the last few weeks the forest department of gujarat did a count of the lions of the deer forest and environs and announced that there were more lions than ever before and they are now in a much larger area than the protected area of the deer forest we are told there are over 700 lions and the lions are in an area of over 30000 square kilometers this is of course a result of years of protection of over uh, well over half a century but it is also seen as something very important politically both for the government of gujarat and for the government of india so when did the lion become so important politically that the number of lions in the forest and their area in which they are ranged is important enough to be announced not only by chief minister but also by prime minister another very different kind of event was a few weeks ago when an elephant was killed uh, allegedly because uh, some protective materials were used by a cultivator or someone else and the death of this elephant in palakkad district led to a very big debate on how elephants are going to coexist with cultivators laborers and others in landscapes where conflict seems more intense than before india has uh, probably around 500 people lose their lives every year to elephants and over 100 elephants are killed and this in a sense telescopes uh, the, the the criss cross or the crossroads of history most of the elephants which are killed are not killed for tusks simply because most of the tuskers have already been eliminated in many forests of southern india over the last 30 years the ratio of the male to the female elephants is 1 to 100 because tuskers have been killed even when their tusks are very small so while the forces of the market have transformed the sex ratio of elephants many elephants are killed or rather most by farmers and cultivators protecting their crops in turn the elephants attack those who come in their way they are both uh, caught in a conflict of living space turning to our own conflicts covid-19 has of course made the headlines and it is widely believed by experts that sometime late last year or early, early this year some wild animal meat possibly of a bat or a pangolin which was not fully cooked was consumed by someone in china this virus of course then entered into the body of some humans and in a very short span it managed to uh, invade the bodies of people in almost all the countries of the world so there are 192 countries all the continents except antarctica are inhabited how did this virus called covid-19 go to all the continents simple answer 1 billion people travel by plane every day and many of those people became the carriers of the virus another bit of news of course is both a plus and a minus the monsoon has broken across many parts of india india is part of a very large region of south asia southeast asia southern china where the rhythms of life of production historically have had a lot to do with the monsoon there are other rainy seasons i am right now in northwest india there is a very brief rainy season in the winter and that rainy season while it is very short is quite significant for farmers and cultivators and for the cycles of life but of course there is nothing to beat the monsoon in terms of the amount of rain that it brings so the coming of the monsoon its failure or its success has been very important historically and even more important in the 20th century because there are models and predictions and we want to know whether the monsoon will come or not a recent book sunil amrit referred to a member of the viceroy's executive council who in 1907 said that india is a country without a budget the budget he proclaimed is only a gamble on the monsoon perhaps not anymore because today much less of the population is dependent on agriculture than ever before agriculture accounts for just about 12 to 14% of the gdp and for the first time in history it occupies less than half the labor force when i say history 
I'm only referring to the last 500 years. I know there's a very long period of history. I assume the proportions were larger. Again. When we look at these sorts of changes, the cycles of flood and drought, the ebb and flow of the rains, the travel of viruses, the careers of not just large animals, but also the various other species that share this living space with us, we are struck by the fact that many of these events we are seeing do have precedence in the past. We all know that the Great War ended in 1918. It was called the Great War because it was the greatest war that had ever been until then. I was once traveling with two lawyers and I'm not disclosing any great secret. They got very upset with two historians, me one of them, who insisted that the people during the First World War did not know that it was the First World War. They just called it the Great War. It was renamed the First World War after the Second World War because their fine legal minds could not grasp this. And they said, you obviously don't know what you're talking about. Maybe they had a point. But one of the features of the Great War is not the war itself where so many humans died, but the great epidemic of what incorrectly was labeled the Spanish flu, because it did not originate in Spain, which we estimate can between 20 and 50 million people were involved. So epidemics are not new. You can go back to 1899, 1900, and the coming of the plague, and there were five waves of bubonic plague. And bubonic plague, of course, is transmitted by a parasite which lives in the body of the rat. And one of the great historians, uh, uh, John uh, uh, William McNeil, in 1976, wrote a book called Plagues and Peoples, looking at the impact of plagues on human societies over the centuries. If you look at the rainfall uh, patterns, 1899 to 1901 was a time when rains failed in many parts of India. In Gujarat, where the lions now live, it was known then uh, by the Vikram Samvatya Chapan, which means 56, and the memory of the Chapani Okan, that is the drought that followed, the failure of the rains in the Vikram Samvatya 56 is still remembered in that area. It would bring about a major change in the behavior of the lions of the forest, because for the only time in the 20th century, uh, uh, till the late 20th century, so one of only two times, they began to prey on a lot of humans. Droughts, of course, are not something new. Uh, as school students, a lot of us had to learn up what are the factors that helped Aurangzeb defeat his brothers in the struggle of the wars of succession. Well, that debate continues. There's a remarkable book written recently by Jeffrey Parker called Global Crisis, where he correlates what we now know about rainfall patterns in the 17th century. And it turns out the years of the wars of Mughal succession, 1640 to 60, roughly, uh, are the time when there are repeated drought failures. There is one estimate that the monsoon failed at least eight years, and there are many other years when the monsoon was weak. This, of course, did not determine who won in the battle of succession. What it did do is that because the crops failed, because productivity on the pastures was low, it was easier to recruit men to fight. The lure of war with booties was, and plunder was uh, all the greater for those who wished to fight in order to make a living rather than simply to uh, uh, subsist on what could often be very little. So when we look at these cycles, it's very interesting, the spread of uh, disease, uh, the ebb and flow of rainfall. You may want to add to it changes in uh, sea or water levels. I, I live in the city of Delhi and I go to work in Sonipat. Uh, whichever route you take, you pass the Red Fort or the Lal Kila built by Shah Jahan. And it is widely believed and quite rightly so that in the time when it was built in uh, Shah Jahan's time in the 17th century, the Yamuna River came up to the, very close to the, the walls of the Red Fort. The Yamuna is nowhere near the Red Fort today because the Yamuna, like a lot of other rivers, has shifted course. So we like to think of life as fixed, of boundaries as fixed, but they are not fixed. They're transforming and changing all the time. Nature is in flux. It's not only the Ebola virus or the COVID-19 virus, uh, which uh, crosses and moves across boundaries. It's also birds and animals. So in many parts of India, the coming of the monsoon is heralded because of the cycle of the seasons. There's a remarkable bird written about by the great Dr. Salim Ali, who incidentally did a very interesting ornithological survey for the Nizam of Hyderabad. In those days, Salim Ali had a problem which many academics are going to face. He had to raise money to do research. So he went to the various princely states and said, I'll write a book about the birds of your princely state and I'll dedicate it to you. So he wrote the birds of Bhutan. He also wrote the birds of Hyderabad. The the Hyderabad on Ornithological Survey. And Salim Ali tells us that the coming of the pipe crystal cuckoo meant the coming of the monsoon. So if you heard this particular bird, it meant the monsoon was in its way. 
the pipe crested cuckoo flies to India all the way from East Africa. Go back and look at uh, very interesting the uh, letters uh, written by Nehru to Indira Gandhi in prison. Not the ones which are very popular. Many people have read letters from a father to a daughter or glimpses of world history. Uh, there are many other letters which begin uh, in 1927 and go on till 64. And the first volume, Freedom's Daughter, has a fascinating letter where he asks the young Indira, Indira Nehru, because she was not married, have you seen a wagtail this year? And she says, yes, there is a very sprightly wagtail. It's very uh, uh, nice. It walks around and uh, flits. It is black and white, but I'm not able to see it because I don't have a pair of binoculars. I only have a pair of opera glasses. And Jawaharlal Nehru in the next letter says, of course, you won't have binoculars. We are in wartime. We are living through a big rebellion. And to get binoculars, you have to have connections with the British, either with the military or the civil administration. So the coming of the wagtail uh, signals the coming of winter. And the departure of the wagtail is the season of Basant, or the coming of spring. Wagtails were mounted in the 1960s by Salim Ali and others with uh, uh, bands. Uh, today, there are much more advanced trans transmitters uh, available, which harmlessly can tell us how far birds migrate. And it's very interesting to know that two of the wagtails which were banded in North India, one ended up in Omsk, and the other ended up in Tomsk. And as those who recall their school geography know, these are in distant Siberia. But we can think of other ways in which one can't think of a space, even one as vast as India, 3 million square kilometers, as apart from the rest of the world. The Arabs had a word for the uh, Indian Ocean, the Western Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea. They called it Al-Bahar Al-Hind. It was the sea that connected the Red Sea, the coast of East Africa, the Gulf states, the Gulf region with India. And across the sea come the, uh, not just the monsoon currents, but for centuries, the doors of the Arab sailors. It is these sailors who probably uh, gave uh, the monsoon also its name. Very interesting, we talked about the elephant, but we don't think very much about another animal, which was historically very important, right into the late 19th century, I would say, or the early 19th century, the horse. One of the most interesting works for me, uh, written recently, was by Thomas Troutman. It's called Elephants and Kings. And it looks at the relationship of elephants, kings, and power. Trotsman's was an argument which is so simple that once you make it, you say, hey, I knew that all along. But actually, it's resulted from decades of very serious scholarship and thought. Trotman asks a question, which given the great protracted contest between India and China in the late 20th century, is worth asking. What is the difference, he asks, between India and China? There are many. Uh, one of them is that China, by the late 20th century, had just about 100 to 200 elephants. In the last 40 odd years, they have been protected. We are told their numbers have grown. The elephants of China live in the southern province of Yunnan, very close to the borders of Indochina, in fact, the nation state of Vietnam. But there are elephants in larger numbers throughout Southeast Asia, and the largest numbers of elephants live in South Asia, in India, smaller numbers in Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Burma. What Trotman does is to ask a question. What explains the disappearance of elephants in China as opposed to their persistence in India? There are many factors. And Chinese historians like Zong Ren and the great Mark Elvin have shown that uh, climate change may have played a role in the decline and disappearance of the elephant in many parts of China. But it was not the only factor. The other was the extension of agriculture and the killing of elephants. In his book, Elvin even gives us uh, early recipes for elephants' trunk. Because the elephants were not only killed, they were eaten. Quite rare in the Indian subcontinent. But more than that, the elephants in China, when captured by kings, were used sometimes ceremonially, but never for war. The war elephant, it is Strutman's argument, by the 6th century BC, if not a little earlier, had become very crucial as an instrument of not just display, but of the striking power of armies. And in order to secure their supplies of elephants, rulers began to take control of the forests where the elephants bred. The gestation period of the elephant, as we all know, is about 23 months. It is very difficult to breed elephants in captivity. They take up to 18 to 24 months to become self-reliant. 
much less than a human baby, which I'm told takes about 18 years, or at least that's what it should. Uh, but uh, in order to secure these supplies of elephants, the king had to secure, or the emperor had to take control of the forest. Trotman then takes us through a fascinating tour of the Arthasastra, manual of statecraft dated by him into the third century of the common era, but obviously going backward in time several hundred years. And in the Arthashastra, there are eight Hastavanas. But the westernmost of the Hastavanas is in Saurashtra. There are also elephants, we are told, in the Indus Basin. And the uh, Arthashastra has two comments on the elephants of Saurashtra. It says they're very small in size, obviously. Uh, Saurashtra was drier than, let us say, the forests of uh, Jharkhand at the time. But the other is it says that they're very bad tempered. They're, it's difficult to tame them. So these elephants become very important in the armies, not only in India, but from around the time of the Alexander's invasion and the Seleucid uh, entry into India, 3rd century BC. This particular model of war elephants then is to be seen in many parts of the world where we would not expect it today. Carthage, Rome, where of course they used elephants from North Africa, Syria, what is today Israel or Palestine, in the Euphrates Valley, in the Nile Valley. And it is the argument of Trotman that the war elephant as an institution became crucial in West Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Of course, the elephant disappeared in many of these areas, but where it has survived, one of the factors that would have harmed the numbers of the Asian elephant, namely, that it was not so much hunted for ivory as trapped for taming, not domestication, but taming. That same factor, because of the nature of statecraft, became a very important reason for the survival, not only of the animal, but paradoxically of its habitat. There's a line in the Arthashastra, which is cited very often by the elephant biologist Sukumar, about to retire later at the end of this month in the, from the Indian Institute of Science, Sukumar made history in another way. In the 1980s, he did his doctoral thesis on the elephant. And because there was no department of ecology, he was registered, believe it or not, in the department of microbiology. The first and last human being on earth to do elephant thesis in the department of microbiology. But one of the points he makes is that if you look at the Arthashastra carefully, the width of the road or the highway is given differently for the nagara or the city, for the grama or the village, and the aranya or the forest. In those forests which were important for elephants, the road was to be narrow because it might disturb the elephants. So this is very interesting, the relationship of state, society, and nature, where elements of the state, in this case, the king or the emperor, take control of the place. So there are actually four elements to this relationship. There's the king or the emperor, there are the elephants, there's the forest or the elephant, and there's the forest, and very importantly, there are the peoples of the forest. These relationships, as we know, were often fraught with tension. I work in a university named after Ashoka. I am very privileged. One of my colleagues is Professor Nanjo Tahiri. Many years ago, she was my uh, BA teacher. Now she is my senior professor. And uh, just around the time she joined the university, she published a book. The book, believe it or not, is a biography of Ashoka. It's a modern biography. It uses not only the edicts and the inscriptions. It looks at the geographies in which they were located. And one of the features she brings out, and this is not new, is the edicts of Ashoka, deciphered first by Prince and others in the 1820s, are fascinating because of the amount of time given for the idea of compassion to living beings other than humans. So while Ashoka promoted Buddhism, he also wanted uh, uh, very good relations of the people of different sects. He made uh, large donations to the Buddhist Viharas. He also helped the Jainas. He helped the Atavikas. He helped various Brahminical groups. But very importantly, he put curbs on the killing, the hunting of animals, the firing of forests. Among the species that he said is not to be killed is one which is today endangered, the rhinoceros, referring perhaps to the great, greater one-horned rhinoceros, which is now still found in parts of Nepal, West Bengal, and Assam. But interestingly, Ashoka also said that the Atavika Rajas, that is the peoples of the forest, their rulers, should behave themselves and obey them, obey him. And if they did not, he said, the Devanam Priyadasi, the beloved of the gods, could do what needed to be done. So Ashoka had a lot of compassion, but sometimes the compassion had its limits. So there's a relationship between the peoples of the forest and uh, imperial power. It's a subordinate relationship, but it could be seen in a different way, that the elephant forests, going back to the Arthashastra, were to be located in the rim of the kingdom, not its center. One could interpret this not literally, but metaphorically. The elephant forests were in areas that were not so valuable for cultivation and which were more important as forest. 
what I'm trying to argue is that state building involves not just power over men or women, not just power over people, the wealth they create, trade, industry, agriculture, but also power over nature. And among the elements of power over nature, which is very important, is animal power. It's a fascinating recent book, many books. He's a man who writes lots of books by a historian from Yale called uh, uh, Alan Mikhail. He wrote a book called Under Osman's Tree and looking at the Ottoman Empire. And there's a very famous story of Osman, you know, he's lying under a tree, he has a dream, he'd have an empire. And the tree, of course, is on ground, there's a stream flowing nearby. And Mikhail argues that uh, in order to make the Ottoman Empire a reality, it needed dominion not, over, not only over people, it had to have control over the forces of nature. This was not literally possible, but to the extent possible, it had to, for stability to occur, there had to be a supply, not only of grain, in this case from Egypt in the 18th century, which is the period studied by Mikhail, but also of animals. The animals were important in the Ottoman Empire for a reason they were important across the world. Until the coming of fossil fuel energy, which became very important after the Industrial Revolution, widespread in the 19th century, and eventually spreading out across parts of Asia, Africa, Latin America, only in the 20th century. The main form of power, that the energy available to people, came from animals. Uh, animals could be horses, buffaloes, cows, horses, uh, donkeys, or elephants. Other forms of energy I'm not looking at, such as wood, which could be burnt. Attraction power, knowledge, if not muscle power of men and women, had to be animals. And here there's something very fascinating that across the centuries, right into the 19th century, the supplies of elephants in India largely came from within the areas that now constitute India. There are cases of elephants brought in from Southeast Asia, but by and large, the elephant supply was within. The size and supply of elephants was larger the further east you went. The size and supply of elephants was worse the further west you went because of the rainfall pattern in North India. This is not a universal pattern. It's very different if you look at the Western Ghats. Today, the largest numbers of elephants are found in southern India, in the states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. And uh, this has historically probably always been so. But we tend to forget that right into the Mughal period, that is the 17th century, the elephants in many areas we would, we would not expect them today. Irfan Habib's map refers, interestingly, and I come back to Gujarat, to uh, trappings of elephants by the ruler Jahangir in the forests of Rajputna. Between 1607 and 1628, the emperor went and captured elephants on seven occasions in these forests. Jahangir was, of course, a fascinating person for a student of history. We know from works of scholars such as Divyavanu Singh, who has a book on the lion, he has a book on the cheetah. He's done fascinating work uh, taking us. Uh, I was looking at inscriptions in the case of Ashoka, the work of other scholars, and here, not only to the written works of Jahangir, but to the rich illustrations. So the Mughals, uh, between the 1560s and 1700s, have an empire which spans half of South Asia, stretches into Central Asia. And this empire, and Jahangir's famous uh, uh, painting where he is embracing Shah Tahamas of Persia, and uh, just under them, this is a symbolic painting. There's a lion and a lamb lying very peacefully. So the, 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 this, this friendship, uh, this, this uh, uh, harmony among the various peoples was supposed to replicate itself in the natural world. There are several accounts of lion hunts by men such as Akbar and Jani. And one of the features in their hunts is that at some time in the hunt, we are told the Pacha came face to face with the lion. And the lion whimpered. Of course, the lion also attacked. So the act of bravery, charging the lion, killing it on horseback as Akbar did, going down on foot as Jahangir does in a famous hunt near Agra where he almost got killed. A lioness tried to maul him and the Rajput noble who saved him was awarded with a very important title. But the animal, the lion, was also able to see not only the power of the emperor, but the divinity that was inherent in him. So what we think of as a very sharp divide between the world of nature and people has not always historically been so. Uh, often, as you know, uh, a particular event between people and nature could herald a bad omen. So the uh, Omras, the senior nobles, would come with news of a lion. The Pacha would go out to hunt, and he had to kill it. Failing to kill the lion could mean that the next military campaign would not succeed. So there are very ways in which, many ways in which, these animals of the forest are signifiers. You see it not only with the power in the temporal sense, you see it in power of the spiritual sense. 
Let me stay with the lion, which has uh, fascinated uh, uh, poets, uh, kings, rulers, uh, composers through the ages. To go back and look very carefully, to go back to our friend Ashoka, there are the lion pillars of Ashoka. But there are so many other instances. Many of you are here. There, I was told over 500 people had uh, signed up. And even if there aren't 500, between us, I'm sure we speak several languages. Many of the languages which are spoken in South Asia have very specific references to an animal like the lion. In Pali, which is very important in the history of Buddhism, the first sermon of the Buddha was known as a Simma Nada, that is the roar of the lion. The, the sermon of the Buddha had the resonance of the roar of a lion. 20 years ago, I was in the Gir forest in the dying days of the last century, 99. We were on a road and we were with two very fine puggies who knew the behavior of the lions. And they told us there are two lions around one kilometer away. And they told us when those lions would cross the road, we were waiting. And suddenly one of the lions roared. And this notion of the Simma Nahada, that the ground seems to tremble when you hear the roar of a lion, it didn't seem so metaphorical out there. Of course, the lions of the gear rarely uh, hunt and kill people, so we were safe. But uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is that these particular animals become very significant culturally. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, writings of the Mughals in Turkey and Farsi, and of course, they were also people who knew Arabic. Uh, they were uh, uh, languages which had different names for the lion. Arabic, for instance, has over 100 names for the lion. One of them is that of a ruler of uh, Syria, Asad. Asad means lion. And the lion is important, not only in cultures where of the regions where it is found. It is important even in literatures like Tamil. Many of you may know about Mahabalipuram, where you know the Indian prime minister and Chinese president had a summit they had coconut water on the beach of Mahabalipuram. And Mahabalipuram, the Pallava uh, sculptures, not only show lions, there is a very famous sculpture of a lioness stalking its prey. It's fairly clear the person who has made this knows how lions stalk their prey. So there are these very deep associations with particular animals. And the animals such as the lion, to go back, Jahangir is going to Mandu. He's brought news of a lion, which is harassing the villagers. Uh, harassing the owners of cattle along the road. So he goes out and kills the lion. And after that, he announces that he has extirpated, extirpated this evil from the face of the earth. So Jahangir writes about the hunting of the lion, the way he will write about crushing of a peasant rebellion. So power, in this case, over the lion, by hunting it, killing it, and fighting it, is seen as very important. This is not only dominion over animals, it is also dominion over people. I was referring, of course, to the horse, and it disappeared from our story. Today, if you were to see people coming to a meeting, you can tell one of the telltale signs of how rich they are is the form of transport they use. So if you have a Mercedes Benz or a Cadillac, you are you know, very well off. In the writings on the Mughal period, we find this applies to horses. The rulers, as well as the very powerful mansabdars, wrote Turkey, Arabic, and Farsi horses. They were, these were horses that were brought after being bred in Central and West Asia. Jos Gomans, in a fascinating book on warfare, shows us that the Mughals were powerful because they controlled both the areas of the horse and the areas of the elephant. Or rather, they controlled both the Western parts of India and the horse supply lines from Western Central Asia because the best horses were bred in Western Central Asia. They were brought in after the foaling season through the passes of the Khyber and the Bodan. There were other routes for horses. The Kingdom of Vijayanagar in southern India procured its horses uh, from uh, the, the Gulf. They came, of course, on ships. And uh, these horses were paid for in silver. So when you think of balance of trade issues, balance of trade of India with the rest of the world, horses were a very important element. They were a military artifact as much as an animal that was imported in large numbers. The Mughals, of course, also began to control the, the stretches of eastern India, which uh, had higher levels of irrigation, denser populations, and large numbers of recruits for the armies. One of the very recent books is by my distinguished colleague, Dr. Pratyanath, Climates of Conquest, where he looks at the problems of the Mughals in conquering areas in the extreme northwest, Afghana, and the extreme northeast, Assam. And one of the fascinating things about Assam is that it was not just the Ahoms who resisted the Mughals. Uh, in an area, the battlefield, very close, in fact, to the present campus of the Institute of Technology, Guwahati. 
nature itself seemed at war to the Mughals, who by then were used uh, in the 17th century to the dry, dusty plains of North India. It rained all the time, they said, three, four months a year. Fields turned into waters and floods. Their homes came on boats, struck in the night and left. And over time, of course, the Mughals tried to adapt to these forms of amphibious warfare, but they found it really difficult. The fascinating uh, note written by Abdul Rahim Khani Khanan, quoted by Eaton, where he writes a letter from Bengal, where he says, this is a very difficult place to live in. The people speak a language I don't understand. There's no good mutton available. I'm forced to live on fish and very stringy kinds of fowl. And I'm sure the fowl he's referring to are not chicken, because until the 1920s, chicken was not eaten by upper strata. He would have been referring to the various game meats, such as fowl or partridge. So this issue of creating states was not only about taming nature, conquering nature, appropriating nature, it was also about coming to terms with the vagaries of nature. There's a very important point we tend to forget, and anyone who has flown over South Asia in a plane or looked out from a train or has journeyed long distances by bus would know that today the mature tree forest looks like islands in a vast ocean of cultivation. Over half the land area is cultivated. If you omit the Thar Desert, the areas that are part of the higher Himalaya and places where the soil is acidic or alkaline or too dry, much of India is today cultivated. But this is a very recent development. Today, our density of population is probably over 400 to a square kilometer. The valleys of the Indus, now in Pakistan, the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, and to go further, the Mekong, the Huang Ho, the Yangtze Kiang, these hold the largest populations of humans or not. But these areas were very different historically. One of the tendencies uh, in uh, some of the early history writing in India uh, on the environment was to assume that prior to the colonial much of the land was covered with forest. This was so widely prevalent that very great scholars such as D.D. Kosambi, who was one of the very, very important scholars of India, assumed that it was the clearing of the primeval forest in the Ganga Basin that marked a very important stage in the second wave of urbanization in the early years of the Commonwealth. We now know from archeological finds that this is simply not true. Rice cultivation had spread long before. The use of iron was widespread and much more important. If we look at the animal remains that are to be found, uh, animals like the black buck, the nilgai, possibly the lion and the cheetah, the wolf, were very widespread in these areas. Recently, in a very interesting compendium where she surveys the literature, Professor Kathleen Morrison has argued that the idea that India was Edenic in its early days itself is an invention. Uh, it was not Edenic, and it certainly, in many areas, was not covered with primeval forests. Look at evidence from the late 19th century, probably. 20% of the land area was covered by savanna. This was tree-covered forest. This might explain uh, the kinds of hunts that are staged by the Mughals in the uh, 17th century, where they not only refer to lions, but vast herds of black bugs, huge numbers of gazelles and nilka. This is the kind of world that the British encountered in the 19th century. It always uh, is, is, a, is a figure I like to cite, that there's a colonel, Acklin Smith, who participated in 1857-58 in the sacking of Delhi. Very horrific after the, the crushing of the rising, the sacking of Delhi. And uh, there are many writings on it. And what many of the writings miss is that soon after the sacking, uh, those who were participants in it, the soldiers, British and Indian, also hunted in the countryside. And Acton Smith did something very interesting. He counted the number of animals he shot. He personally shot over 300 lions. 55 of them, he said, were within one day's horse ride of Delhi. There's new work which is yet to be published by young scholars like Raza Kasmi, which will show that the lion numbers in areas of Haryana, Punjab, Delhi were probably much more than we thought. About. So there is a very interesting situation where there is a there is a range of a mosaic of landscapes. It's not only mature tree forest, it's tree covered savanna, it's scrub jungle, it's grassland. And the area of cultivation, as late as 1600, I'm going by Shumit Guha's estimates, permanent cultivated arable was only 25% of the landscape. So this transformation of the late 19th, early 20th century is a very significant thing. It's not just the numbers of people, it's what they do to the land. Today, half the land is cultivated. The mature tree forest looks like islands of forest in a sea of cultivation. This was not always historically so. The second, of course, is related to that shift, which I hinted at, between animal muscle power and human muscle power and other forms of energy. 
in the 1880s, uh, the Jharia, Raniganj coal fields are opened up. Coal is brought out from the bowels of the earth. 1880s also is the first oil fields, though the major exploitation of oil should be dated to the 1920s. So the coming of oil, the coming of coal before that, the coming of natural gas is a very major event. This can be illustrated uh, with uh, a short quote from uh, work of my late supervisor, Professor Tapan Raichaudhri, who pointed out that in the 19th century, the vast network of trains and railways were developed by the British. So beginning in the 1850s and by 1900s, vast areas of South Asia is one of the large rail networks. Until the 1840s and 50s, much of the transport long distance was done in the Deccan, in North India, and various parts of Southern India by groups like the Banjaras. There are records of Banjaras even in the 1840s of over 40,000 uh, pack bullocks transporting grain and salt, which were then sold to armies. Now, these Banjaras had complex relationships with the uh, uh, cultivators. They sold them grain, they sold them uh, salt, they also uh, uh, purchased uh, uh, items from them, and they sold also their best heifers, which had a good bachada uh, to sell it to them. Uh, but the relationship was not uh, always so harmonious. They were also armed. Uh, they could on occasion not be traders. They could be raiders. And uh, these sorts of groups, so there is a very uh, uh, serious attempt to bind them down by earlier rulers as well, but nothing so persistent and serious as under the British. Beginning the 1820s, but clearly by the 1860s and 70s, some of these groups even start getting classified as different tribes. Meena Radha Krishna's work shows this with groups like the Lombardas in southern India that the uh, Lombardas who were earlier regarded as productive and uh, a positive uh, set of traders began to be seen extremely negatively. Uh, Professor Bukhya is here, Bukhya is, uh, Bhangya Bukhya is here, and he has of course written about the relationship with the Nizam of Hyderabad and the Lombardas. What happens when nomads settle? But this is only one part of the story. The coming of the railways of course led to other changes. Uh, in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of environmental history writing, and quite rightly, many of us concentrated on the forest. Uh, people in the audience may or may not have read of, read of our books, but you would have read or seen news of a boy that never lived in the Indian forest, Mowgli. But you may have forgotten what Mowgli did when he grew up. He became a forest guard. So Kipling's first published piece on the Jungle Book, 1893, in the Rook, begins with an ode to the forest department, because he said it's the forest department which provides the timber for the railways, and it's the railways that ferry the trains that take soldiers who crush rebellions. And he said, it's the most important department other than the commissariat of the Indian army. And Mowgli, we are told, was a forest guard. It's quite boring that really he sort of gets married and settles down and earns his keep. But, but it has fascinating insight into the role of the forest guard. The role of the forest guard is to protect the saplings, drive away the goats of the villagers and ensure that they grow up into mighty timber trees. So there you are, the appropriation of the forest, the transformation of the forest into a timber manufacturing. And between the 1860s and uh, the 1900s, the British take over, uh, uh, over uh, almost uh, half a million square kilometers of forest. It's a crowning administrative achievement, but it also is one which brings them into sharp conflicts with a range of people who the forest is not just a source of timber. It's not just a place of trees. It could be a grazing ground. It could be the place where they cut a kumri or dhaiya or uh, other forms of shifting cultivation in order to grow crops for some time before they move on to another side. It could be a place for hunting, for herding, for fishing, or for simply taking a range of products. There's a range of products of the forest, which peoples both within the forest and in the edge of the forest subsist on. Think of something very important to a famous Telugu speaker who is no more, who changed his name. He was a tantric called Chandra Swami. It was very important in the scandals of the 1990s. And Chandra Swami, believe it or not, sat on a tiger skin. I'm sure he didn't kill the tiger. He bought it from someone who did. So the uh, tiger skins could be one of the uh, forest products which were uh, uh, important for trade. There could be others. And this range of livelihoods, this range of forms of living, these range of forms of trade come into sharp conflict here with the transformation of the nature of the state because the taking of the forest in the late 19th century of course, drawn earlier precedents, but went beyond anything that had been seen in this part of the world ever before. So when we look at the state in India today, the conflicts of the forest are not just over the lion, the tiger, or the elephant. They're over the land itself. Over the last uh, uh, 15 years, India has often rocked by a lot of scandals. 
It's not a coincidence. Many of the scandals are about mines. There are mines for coal, there are mines for iron ore, there are mines for bauxite. And the lands where these are often mined from are forest lands. Whose lands are these? Do they belong to the forest department? Who owns the wealth that is under the land? That's a, that's a complicated question. Well, the answer is whoever pays the most at the auction. That's, that's the ruling of the Supreme Court and the policies of the government of India today. But note here a very interesting shift. In the late 19th century, there was a shift in areas that were earlier significant only as potential cultivated areas, also gained value as forest. So there's a different economic outlook of what the forest is for. Today, since 96, Supreme Court judgment, there's very little forestry in the forest. The job of the forest department is supposed to protect the forest. The forest department, remember, was originally set up in order to generate revenue, to protect the interests of the state. There's a debate about how far it worried about climate and desiccation. The literature drew, drew attention to that. But I think there's very little doubt that in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the maximizing of revenue or the strategic aims of the empire were critical to it. In independent India, this became the progress of the nation and its economy. So the forest would provide pulp, timber, uh, bamboo for making paper, and so on and so forth. Today, we are seeing yet another shift. It's not the forest which is important. It is the land. It's not the land itself. It is what lies under the land. So we see this vast industrial extractive economy transforming the landscape in very fundamental ways. Not only the forest, the land itself. Think of something very interesting. Very significant new book, Sunil Amrit, uh, uh, Unruly Waters, which looks at the history of dam building. And one of the fascinating features is that by the end of the 20th century, which ended only 20 years, 20 years ago, India was among the five nations on earth with the largest number of big dams. The others, interestingly, were America, Russia, China, and Japan. So you can see most of these countries are in Asia. And if you include Japan, China, and India, or just say China and India, these are among the two most populous countries. What are the implications of building so many big dams? And there is a major debate, as you are well aware, about the rights of the displaced, uh, the question of uh, uh, who should speak for the future. Uh, should we look at those who are displaced, or should we look at those who will gain through water and power from the harnessing of these dams? The debate in the Narmada, of course, was known all over the world. Equally important work has been done on the Godavari. It's a very important new book by Saikya, Unquiet River on the Brahmaputra. Let me go to the last because we've hardly looked to the Northeast today. And one of the features uh, Saikya brings up is the sheer size and volume of water the Brahmaputra discharges down, coming from the islands of uh, 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 southern Tibet uh, through the valley uh, uh, which it carves out in Assam. It seems few million years ago, the Brahmaputra flowed not into the Paddo or the Ganga, but into the Iravati Chindwin, I didn't know this. And uh, what is important, of course, is that the schemes and plans to tame the upper reaches of the Brahmaputra through dams are more recent, but schemes and plans to build embankments to tame the floods of Brahmaputra really gathered force in the late years of the imperial era and became very important in independent India. And the Saikya's argument is very simple. It argues that if you build so many of the embankments, he's not so much looking at the dams, but the embankments in the lower reaches of the Brahmaputra, it ignores a very simple point that at the time of the monsoon, the quantum of the water goes up enormously. That can go up 1 to 20, then go up 1 to 50, then go up 1 to 100, it can go up 1 to 300. The force of the water is such that in many places, it has made the embankments a self, uh, virtually a self goal. The people who built the embankments have failed to control the floods. And he argues that over long periods, people have learned to live with and these sort of permanent embankments may not be the best idea. He's not saying they should be built. He's simply arguing that you cannot ignore the history, not only of the lay of the land, but of the waters themselves. Does the river have a personality? Is the river an actant? Is the river a historical actor? Does the river, to use the language of a lot of my more theoretically minded historical friends, does the river have agency? I don't know. But the river may not have agency. It may not be conscious that it's the river, but it has certain rhythms. This is something of great significance, which I think environmental history in its larger sense places on the agenda. When we look at the 20th century and the long 19th century, we are struck by the significance of the ideas of justice, of dignity, the idea that all humans have the right to live with dignity, that people should have freedom, 
that dignity should not be confined to people of certain uh, status, privilege, or birth. We are living at a time of, you know, the Black Lives Matter in the United States. And it's very disconcerting to, to recall that even at the time of the founding of the Great Republic of the United States, 1776, many of the people who were present in the Philadelphia Convention thought that owning a slave was, was their right. They not only owned slaves of men of other color and women, there were also various forms of bondage in the United States of even uh, white men, which is not widely known. In the Indian case, the search for the dignity of people of all castes, of communities, uh, across uh, the gender divide has been a very important feature of the freedom movement. But what happens when you take these ideas of dignity? I'm saying dignity, and I'm not saying equality for a very particular reason, it'll become evident in a minute, and apply it to other species and other generations. So we cannot obviously argue, and even someone who has great affection for elephants such as me will not argue, that the life of an elephant is worth the life of a human. I'm not saying that. But just as we worry about the lives of the people killed by elephants, and we also worry about the lives of the elephants, why only the lives of the elephants in human life, in, in terms of life and death? Let's also think of the emotional lives of these elephants. One is very struck when one reads literatures or listens to literatures. The elephant is a very interesting animal because in very few cultures in South Asia is it regarded just as another animal. So when Rama is told of the death of Dashrata, I'm referring to Valmiki Ramayana, it will be so in many Ramayana. He collapses, he falls down. And it is said he fell down the way the mother elephant will fall if she hears the death of a car. Fascinating. Fascinating. They've transformed the son into a relationship with the father because he knows the father is ill and weak. But it's a filial relationship. right? Similarly, the, 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 the uh, way in which the elephant is angered in the battlefield is compared to the way a warrior is angered in the battlefield. So this idea of affect, the idea of dignity and emotion in the animal world, is not unique uh, to our sensibility. There are many kinds of sensibilities about animals and plants. How can we draw on those sensibilities? And do we not need to draw on those sensibilities? Let me go back to the river. One of the very interesting times I had in IIT Guwahati is that they organized a picnic. So we got a small boat, we went with the dolphin specialist and we went on a small river and for literally two minutes, no more, we saw a very lovely creature called Liravadi dolphin. It jumped out of the water, jumped down, jumped up, jumped down, and then it was gone. The dolphins, of course, as you know, have to come out and surface in order to breathe. The Iravadi dolphin, the Mekong dolphin, the Ganges dolphin, the Indus dolphin are unique. Like us, they are mammals. They have remarkably developed uh, systems of communication in these very murky waters. They communicate the way bats do through uh, you know, uh, sounds which are so uh, high frequency that we cannot hear them. Incidentally, elephants can also do that. Elephant sitting in Hyderabad University can talk to a person in the town of Hyderabad, not talk, but it, it, can, it can send signals. Now, these are very recent discoveries. I want to bring the, the story of the river back into this because one of the realities of the 21st century is that the first species of river dolphin to become extinct was in China. It's called the Yangtze dolphin or the Biju. Now, China under communist China is even more nationalist than the nationalists. They're very disappointed to know that the Biju had disappeared. So they got a lot of scientists to play recordings of these calls of the dolphins, and they sailed up and down the river, but there were no dolphins left. The river has been transformed so much that there's no space for the dolphins. And this is something India faces. Many of the plans to transform the Ganga into national water highway, many of the dams to build new barrages and dams on the rivers will endanger not only the dolphin, but the complex set of biota that lives in the river. So how is it? that when we think of dignity and justice for other humans, which we should, all humans as we should, we can also think of dignity and justice for other species. What about dignity and justice for other landscapes? Uh, I referred to the lion hunts of uh, Jahangir, uh, but uh, Jahangir also hunted black buck. Some of them were in a place, many of you may have heard of, it was called Palam, which is now an airport. Palam still has some Nilgai. In those days, it had a lot of black buck. So the black buck was an animal of the open plains. It has vanished. It's found in very small pockets today. So how do we think of the landscape of the black buck, the dry grassland and scrub, also as a landscape, which should not just be annihilated and destroyed? So what, what are the uses of history is a question one asks. I'm in a school group, and today I'm not sharing any great secret with you. The big question one of my colleagues said is, what are your professors teaching your students when they leave college? What is their market worth? 
So I wanted to ask him, I don't know what their market worth is. But do you really want to measure their worth only in terms of market? What is the market worth of your grandmother? What is the market worth of your grandfather? What is the market worth of your most beloved aunt and uncle? Uh, what is the value you give to a small niece or nephew who comes and plays with you? I'm sure you will argue that you cannot put a value on these relationships. There's a reason. Some relationships are beyond economic value. They may have a value in other terms. There may be terms such as sensitivity, affection, companionship. One of the points I think is that we know from a lot of the work environmental disciplines that nature is contested. It is contested as resource, but it is also contested as meaning. And one of our great dilemmas of the modern age that when progress is measured in market worth for individuals and GDP for countries, and it will continue to be, I'm not saying we do and it will, we also think about notions of justice and dignity. And justice and dignity and respect for that diversity of knowledges also has to have some component, hopefully, of justice, dignity, respect, different kinds of knowledges of and about nature. Dignity across species, dignity across generations. Uh, one of the important uh, points of the petrochemical age is that many of the products of the petrochemical age and the technological age will outlast us. Not only nuclear waste, even plastics. They will outlast the lifespan of every single human being you know, multiplied by 10, 100, or 1,000. So there is something we are doing to the waterscape, landscape, and atmosphere, which will live on beyond us. How do we to account for our responsibility to the future? This is not simply an ethical question, which was common to all religions. It's a practical and real question in our day. The nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, how that. And to end with this, I just want to point out that nature is contested also in terms of what it means to different people. One person's dream could be another's nightmare. And one of the very positive features of India and Indian public life is that particularly since the late 1960s, We've had a very active public sphere in which these issues, the search for peace with nature, have come to occupy uh, not only some of the finest minds in academia, but large sections of our society. These are issues not just of life and death or the quality of life. They are also a question which are important as a society and a civilization. When I began, I started by talking of Delhi, which is very famous for all sorts of awful reasons. It is one of the two most polluted cities on earth. But one positive way of looking at it is that uh, the areas that now comprise the city of Delhi have had urban settlements for over 1,000 years. For over 1,000 years, people have built towns and cities in the areas that now comprise Delhi. And one of their dilemmas has been how to keep this space habitable and productive. My colleague never published this paper, Professor Sunil Kumar, he's head of department history now. Many years ago, he gave a paper where he showed that the sultans of Delhi did not rely on water of Yamuna for drinking. It seems they built small check dams from the streams that came from the ridge Aravalis and flowed down into the Yamuna. Many of these were later converted into stormwater drains. And the tragedy of the paper which Professor Sunil Kumar read is that by the time he read the paper, many of the drains had been covered up and one of them has become a very important expressway, uh, highway, uh, flyover called the Barapula. But what he showed is that this area, which has such little rainfall, there were ways of trapping the water, storing it in dams, and that trickle of water would become a flow through the air. So what are the ways in which we keep these landscapes productive and habitable? So there is a lot from the history that we can learn from creativity. And if there is a, a larger point to be made, is that nature and the environment are as important to the study of history as they will be for our future. Thank you. Sorry, I went on for one hour. My apologies. I hand over to the chair. We can take questions. I've got some questions here. I'm, so we can begin with them or we can wait. Thank you. Uh, it seems that Mangya has got some problem. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you. Please go ahead. So, yeah. so maybe we can uh, take a few questions. There are uh, some people who have raised their hands uh, virtually. So may I ask them to ask the question? There is uh, Sanjay Barolia who raised uh, his hands. 
Mr. Sanjay, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? I don't know if by mistake. Mr. Sanjay, can you hear me? There is another uh, one raising his hands, which is Shama. Shama, uh, am I audible to you? Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, please come. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, uh, the session is very interesting and very informative for me. Hmm. Uh, my question is, uh, there have been a lot of laws enacting to protect the environment. And our hmm. tradition also teaches the importance of protecting nature. Hmm. But hmm. today's condition is very different. Hmm. Who is responsible for this environmental pollution? The government agency hmm. or the, the common public, common people? Hmm. What what do you think? Who do you think is responsible? Is there one person responsible, or are there lots of people responsible? Are there people who are more responsible and less responsible? I think uh, uh, from the part of uh, uh, some group uh, try to protect the environment, another group try to exploit try to exploit maximum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me put it to a very simple way. I I live close to a very small sanctuary, Okla Bird Sanctuary. It has several types of herons. It has some nilgai. And as you know, uh, close to the sanctuary, there is a major, you know, highway that has been built. On the other side, okay. there's a park. But okay. uh, this land is also used for grazing by, you know, uh, local villagers. Okay. And uh, in the long run, we don't know how this sanctuary will survive. That land may oh. be wanted for a mall. It oh, may be wanted for a school. So I think oh. that there are contending forces okay. to control nature and okay. often what we tend to forget is that there can be unintended consequences so let me give you a very strange example you know you're in a hurry you take a cab to go to work or you travel in a car or you take a scooter or a motorcycle your objective is to get to work it is not your objective to pollute the city absolutely not but the unintended consequence of the use of the gas or petrol or diesel is that the quantum of pollutants in the atmosphere goes up. You want to solve the problem. You can take a step solving the problem by, let us say, taking public transport. You may take a metro or a bus. But I'm sure you will agree, all agree that metro and bus will only work if they are on time, if they are affordable, and if they are tuned in such a way that a very large number of people can move in a short span of time, large distances safely. What do we get from this? Whatever the answer, it cannot be only a personal answer. Whatever you do, you can't only do it as an individual. It is collective. So the question is, what happens societally? What happens at a larger level? So I don't think there's an easy answer to this. My submission would be that we should question the question. I've been asked a lot of questions on a very interesting point, which I want to bring up. Somebody has asked that after COVID-19, will we take animal power more seriously? Uh, will we take questions of nature and animals as actants more seriously? We should. After all, when we look at a very important uh, uh, creature which has played a role in our own history in this part of the world, is the malarial mosquito. There are many forms of malaria. There are many mosquitoes that transmit malaria. And settlement in many areas was difficult until there were answers to malaria. To go back to the Gir forest, it was possible for lions to live in the Gir forest because people in the Gir forest had malaria and had in the British records what was called an enlarged spleen. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The coming of pinin, the coming of controls on the mosquitoes, it was difficult to colonize these areas. Yes, so the malaria yes. frontier has played a very important role in Indian history. More recently, the bubon bubonic plague was very important. Uh, there is a scholar, I think he's originally from Telangana, a 
He has written a very important uh, number of books, Prashant Kidambi. And Kidambi's first book looked at the uh, making of imperial metropolis and the Bombay Improvement Trust, which was set up after the plague. And a lot of uh, the chawls of Bombay with, slight, with better housing conditions were designed because it was in the interests of the industry, such as the House of Tatas, the imperial government, the provincial government, the mill owners, and the workers who have better housing. This was not entirely painless, and Kidambi shows us some 60, 70,000 people were displaced and shoved away so that these settlements could be built. But there was a very powerful response in terms of policy to the plague. So there is no question at all that uh, uh, even if these uh, animals, such as the rats, which brought the plague, were not aware of what they do, the, the, the breeding cycle of the rat and the, the, the organisms that spread the plague had major consequences for humans. Sorry, we can have one more question. Yeah, there are quite a lot of questions in the chat box. Perhaps uh, we can take uh, okay. some more. Okay, um, Chitra, and, Chitra and D has asked, how do you see yeah. Gandhi's notion of ahimsa and vegetarianism, the larger context of nature-human relations? Gandhi's notion of ahimsa was about much more than vegetarianism. Very little studied episode in his life which has been studied by Erickson, the dogs in Ahmedabad, some of them developed rabies. They tried to attack the workers. The workers didn't know what to do. They went to Ambalal Sarabhai, and with Ambalal Sarabhai's assistance and Gandhiji's blessing, they killed some of the rabid dogs. They then took the dogs in, uh, in some carts, the dead dogs, through the uh, township. And then many of the traders downed the shops and did a uh, semi mini hartal. And both sides agreed to get arbitration by Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Gandhi's intervention in this is a very specific one. So I'm just using it to illustrate that he argued Ahimsa is a concept. And he specifically argued vegetarianism is not the end of Ahimsa. Vegetarianism is only part of Ahimsa. Ahimsa, he argued, is taking away the desire for violence. But self-defense, he argued in this case, does not constitute violence. He specifically said if a rabid dog is attacking a child, it is your duty to stop the dog by whatever means are necessary. He defined it very carefully. Only immediate self-defense. It is not violence. So I think that when we look at Gandhi's notion of Ahimsa, we have to look at it in the larger sense. And you're all aware that in the late 1920s, in his answer to Sakhlatwala, the Parsi communist who was an MP, very important okay. figure in the anti-imperial struggle. He said that it will be very dangerous if India takes on the same path that England has gone down. If it takes on the same path, uh, it will strip the earth like a pack of locusts. So here he was talking about violence in terms of nature in the larger sense. So I think the Gandhi notion of Ahimsa is very important, but he was not imposing it on other people. And he was trying to craft responses in a complex situation. We can look at his ideas and not reduce him just to a doctor. It is, of course, very important. Doesn't have all the answers. Has very interesting questions. Yeah, we can take another question. Yeah, there are a few other questions uh, below. There is a question from Dr. Emin Jadish. Are you seeing that, yeah. uh, Professor Mahesh? No, there are lots of questions. Why don't you read it out? Everyone can okay. know what the... Right. Let me try to do it. Okay. So this is, uh, you have uh, talked of the agrarian settlements in North India and the monsoon, and also referred to the dense population in North and Eastern India, an issue that is central to Indian. And uh, I'm sorry. And South Asian uh, and Southeast Asian environment and agriculture is the decline of the mm. Tibetan glaciers that uh, water and sustain around 49% of the human population mm. in mm. the form of river flows from the glacial mm. melt of the Tibetan mm. plateau. Mm. The question of rivers on the Tibetan plateau is almost marginal except for a few writers. How do you explain mm. this? Is this because of the political issue that is uh, connected with the question of Tibetan environment or something else? No, you're right uh, that the snow melt of the Himalayas has been very important in maintaining the perennial river flows of the waters of all the northern regions of South Asia. The Indus, Ganga, Brahmaputra, only the larger rivers. Number of tributaries originate uh, because of the uh, snow melt uh, 
the glaciers are one part of the snow melt they are moving rivers of ice this is a very large question to which i don't think there's a one line answer there is a debate of whether the glaciers are retreating or not and as you know there are over 10000 glaciers uh, these span the entire larger himalayan and trans himalayan region from pamirs in the west right up to the extreme northeast what we do know however is that the major reason for the absence of perennial river flow is because lot of dams have been built on the hills in many areas there is no water because the, the the water has been impounded in dams and the impounding in dams is to ensure constant flow of water for the turbines this doesn't mean constant flow of water adequate for the biota this is being looked at there is a very important uh, you know uh, uh, ganga uh, committee headed by the prime minister and they are studying and the court is also involved what is the minimum river water flow you need to keep the biota and the ecological systems in the river there are various calculations 10% 25% but please note the real intervention with the hydrological cycle is through linear structures on the river one of the big difference of southern india and northern india going back to school geography books is that northern indian rivers were perennial most of the southern indian rivers are seasonal the peninsular rivers depend on rainfall right and the northern indian rivers also depend on rainfall but much less so the other point which is very crucial 60 70% of the irrigation in india does not come from rivers and canals particularly after the tubal revolution of the 1960s and 70s most of the water for irrigation is groundwater what is a much more worrying factor which is immediate is 60 65% of the land mass today the groundwater levels are declining more rapidly than they are being replenished so there is definitely a lot of concern about the glaciers the implications of climate change for the glaciers whether they are retreating whether they are declining and this will require cooperation at all and every levels and between various nation states in this case not only india and china but all the countries of the world the great historian of china ken pomeranz has a paper called the third water tower it seems after north pole and south pole max amount of frozen water believe it or not is in the himalayas so there could be a third pole don't tell someone to write in geography exam they get zero because in india if you say something intelligent or original you sometimes get zero but i think that we have to also pay attention to these other issues how many dams should come up on a river should there be some rivers without dams how can dams be made more designed in better way for irrigation and for drinking water many of us are in cities which are depleting the ground water much faster than it's being replenished wherever you live whichever city you live in chances are in 10 years going to be more difficult to get water than it is today because we are depleting it we are also contaminating it this is related to a very interesting question ashish khaka has asked everyone how do we develop more sensitive environmental policies for urban centers well one of them is to try and understand how water in ground water is recharged how is it contaminated how can we recharge the ground water faster than we are doing today and one answer is that many of our cities are being paved over the more and more land is paved over the less water will seep into the into the ground okay there is this question from uh, prakash kumar uh, hi mahesh prakash here thanks for the fascinating talk i will keep it short can you reflect on this do you think the covid-19 virus is going to press we historians to take animal power as you defined most is i think you have answered this question already and there is another question uh, from anindita mukhopadhyay it is a very thoughtful talk and some questions come to mind you look at the role of state power and its link to the animal power you also look at the human imagination which weaves which weaves in the presence of the animals in its expressive languages and across all cultures these connections persist but isn't it this uh, uh, very selective specific to cultures and in what way these cultures define the usefulness of animals in the contemporary world surely the shift is towards all animals not uh, just a selection of certain animals in theory at least somehow you did not emphasize the one sided definition of human imagination it makes the sentiment uh 
sorry, the sentient world totally dominated by the figure of the human. By sorry, sentient world totally dominated by the last set last bit. By the figure of the human. I think this is a comment. It is not a question. There is. A, this is absolutely yeah. true. This is a talk where I have emphasized the things I find fascinating. And if someone else gave the talk, they'd find other things fascinating. But I, I do want to uh, uh, I appreciate your point that on the one hand, we are arguing that different life forms should be accorded significance. Uh, uh, we didn't get into it. What's the, is there a dividing line between animals and plants? Many of the things we think are unique to animals are shared by plants. Uh, plants move. Uh, plants uh, communicate in complex ways. So suppose I widen it and make it living organisms in general. This is There's no easy answer to this. We don't even know how many organisms there are. There are classifications of species, and some say there are 5 million, some say there are 10 million. And as we have been debating and discussing, some of those invisible to naked eye, malarial parasite, the plasmodium, or COVID-19 or Ebola, may be much more important than the elephant and tiger. There are other ways to, uh, to argue this. So there's a fantastic uh, essay by E.O. Wilson, which I love showing to the first year students. And it starts by saying there are so many life forms. It seems under the eyebrows, all our eyebrows, there are 14 varieties of mites, M-I-T-E-S. They live under the human eyebrow. And not only that, if you look at the intestinal system, it cannot function without number of bacteria, which have evolved to live in it. So when you have antibiotics, the reason your digestion is bad for some time, possibly, is that the antibiotic kills the good bacteria. So see, we've already classified the bacteria. So there is a complex web of that. There is a complexity of this interaction. The idea of focusing on certain animals is very simple. As a student of history, they leave a paper trail. The tigers, the elephants, the lions leave a paper trail. They leave a trail because there are conflicts. Where there are conflicts, there are going to be documents. Where there are documents, there'll be different views. Where there are different views, There'll be contests, and where there's contests, it's a lawyer's dream, it's also a historian's dream. We can debate, what are they really contesting? So I would argue that certain animals, birds, plants, trees, landscapes, riverscapes, have captured the imagination more than others. These need not be large animals. When one looks at uh, Western India, Marwad, one of the very important trees historically is the Kejri. It is able to retain uh, green leaves even in a drought. So the KGD figured in the courts of arms of some of the rulers because they were trying to build a relationship with the people who lived in the desert. They also wanted to recruit them for their armies. They wanted them to, pay, to pay taxes. The tree which is anyway celebrated by these people was also made a very important tree in the court of arms. Look at, for instance, the significance in the recent years of the sharks, there are many varieties of sharks in and around India, about 18 of them are captured and eaten. And uh, one day in the early 2000s, there was a lot of lobbying. Shark fin soup was seen as responsible for the decline of sharks and shark fishing was banned. My colleague, Dr. Divya Karnat, has uh, recently won a very major Future of Nature Award. She's originally a biologist and she became a geographer. And she argued that the ban on shark fishing is a very bad idea. Firstly, there's no way of enforcing it. There's absolutely no way of enforcing it, unless you sit and catch hold of each person who brings a shark. And certain species of sharks are protected. But how will you find out which species of shark they're catching? The second is more interesting. She said this shark fin soup is very important in certain Asian countries, such as say, Japan, Western world. And shark fin exports are important. There's an equally large factor which is forgotten. Shark meat is eaten in many parts of India and in the Gulf. And the major reason for shark fishing in India in recent years is sharks for meat, not sharks for fins. So even sharks with very small fins may be caught hold of. And she showed that in some cases, even pregnant sharks are being killed, which is a very major breeding site. So she then argued that rather than ban, you should work with fishes and have certain seasons when the sharks are not hunted, let us say when they're breeding. So I do agree with you. We do need a broader sense of the of organisms and uh, of uh, sentient creatures. And of course, mine is a selective reading. I, I, I make no bones. I would like more such questions. And uh, I, I will quote uh, Dr. Marx when asked by his daughters what his favorite maxim was. He said, doubt everything. So please doubt whatever I'm saying. 
question it. I, I, I'm completely with the spirit of the question. I'll keep it in mind. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mahesh, uh, for the wonderful lecture. I mean, so you uh, very uh, uh, systematically connected the relation between state and you know, society uh, uh, with, with, with you know, the, the ecology. I mean, so particularly uh, the importance of animals and you know, water bodies in you know, the state uh, building. Actually, initially, I mean, so our uh, administrator uh, uh, muted me, so I could not uh, take it up. Uh, I have you know, two specific uh, uh, issues. Um, one is, uh, if you see, uh, uh, you know, the, there is a uh, there is a there is a uh, imagination of a lion as you know, the symbol of a power from the, you know, the early history. So, I mean, so of course, uh, almost all the martial books and you know, of course you know, uh, rulers you know, the celebrated uh, uh, lion you know, as you know, the power of symbols. But you also see you know, the worshipping of lion uh, even in the you know, tribal communities and you know, other mm. communities. Mm. Mm. So uh, uh, I mean, sir, I didn't uh, understand uh, uh, you know, the, the, how this imagination actually you know, mm. Uh, mm. come up and you know how actually you know communities uh, relate this uh, with their uh, uh, politics mm -hmm. and you know with their uh, mm -hmm. say you know the life other thing that's one mm -hmm. the other thing is uh, now i mean in a woman civilization as you said that there is always a uh, contested relation between society and another you know, nature and uh, the you know the conquest over the nature is seen as you know achievement and you no know, success. Mm -hmm. So uh, can we see I mean uh, the uh, present uh, pandemic as a kind of you know side effect of our achievements over uh, uh, nature uh, something like that? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good, well, very good question. Okay, the first is easier. You see, with the lion, we know less about these relationships partly because in the 19th century, as you know, in a period of 70, 80 years, it disappeared. But the very interesting recent work on mega mammals in ancient India by Shivani Bose, which uh, looks not only at the archaeological record, but the textual records on tigers, rhinos, and elephants, right up to around the 8th century of the common era. These two animals, lion and tiger, are both very significant. They're not only really significant for rulers, they are significant because they are powerful animals, which can be a threat to life. So if you look at the Jatakas, and she has done a lot of study of the Jatakas, the lion there is a dispenser of justice in the forest. Many of the Bodhisattva uh, avatars are lions and elephants because they are seen as preeminent among the animals. Now, this is allegorical. We should take it to the truth. But in many other writings, the lion is, uh, is, is uh, the, the same power which fascinates, also evokes fear. So I think when you look at peoples who live in proximity to these animals, both elements will be present. There will be fear, there will also be awe. There's very important work done by the anthropologist Sunetra Goshal and the ecologist Vidya Atreya. They have done a lot of work in Western Maharashtra in recent years. And in Western Maharashtra, she has described a lot of places where a tiger or a leopard attacked a human there are certain hero stones that have been put. Often the hero stone celebrates the person who killed an animal. There is a group of sheep or goats going on a hillside. A leopard attacks them. The person who kills them is celebrated. But it's very interesting. They also pay respects to the leopard. I don't want to romanticize these relationships. What I want to say is that there are very large cohabited spaces in which the relationship need not be one either or. So there is a lot of lore both at the community and I will argue at the elite level. So go back to our friend Jahangir. When Jahangir kills a lion, the shikaris come and the people there and they take away the fat of the lion or the whiskers of the lion because it's very important local medicine. Now remember, no lion is going to give you its whiskers. To get the whiskers, you have to kill the lion. So I think that uh, it's a very good question and uh, there's a very interesting point in the deer forest itself where lions are found and the areas around, they are not killed. 
the gir largely is the the people in gir are maldharis who live in nesses who have buffaloes they are vegetarian they do poison and kill lions and in the 1960s there was a lot of threat of the extinction of lion because the lions were hunting lot of livestock now the incidence of livestock hunting has come down so i think people who live in and around these arenas there are both elements of conflict and cohabitation there are very complex relationships and we have to investigate them and you're right one one has to keep in mind those relationships may be different your other question is a very very serious one uh, is a time of crisis a time for pause and rethinking yes after all in the late 1960s and there was is playing music sorry in the late 1960s there were two successive droughts and these did play a very important role in uh, creating a sense of uh, a pause and leading to lot of rethinking not only among movements not only at the societal level even at the state level so this attempt to save the tiger project tiger or even the gear lion sanctuary project some of it spurs derived from the idea that the forest was important in terms of the hydrological cycle of stabilizing the flow of water so i think there's a reinvention of these animals as keepers of the monsoon forest now who would then keep the monsoon forest should it be state should it be community so the power reside with the danda or should it be participate this is a very important area of debate so i, I, I definitely crisis lead to be thinking and to be positive even the building of the big dams certainly the dams of uh, bakra and nangal or mangala in uh, pakistan uh, were not only for hydro power they were seen as uh, trapping the water enabling you know double cropping of the land irrigation for the sake of food security remember we were looking at a very different kind of landscape where there had been uh, virtually stagnation in farm yields in the early 20th century so definitely it's a time for pause definitely it's a time for rethinking but whether it will be utilized what will come of it we don't know are you not stuck that the immediate impact of covid-19 is widespread use of chemical sanitizers and plastics both of which are immediate knee jerk responses without very much thought to the long term consequences it's not fair to tell people not to use it but at some time we have to rethink a better way so do you think people will stop eating wild animals because of this i doubt it will they be more careful in their conduct with wild animals we hope so so yes a crisis is a time for rethinking it can be a time for strong measures for reform but the most important thing about any crisis is it should make us rethink how we look at the past and rethinking the past will not give answers lot of people have written questions will it give the answers i can assure you it won't but it can give us better questions it can give us insights it can give us clues and those clues and insights may lead us to a better way Uh, thank you my uh, we can take uh, two three questions okay. just uh, pick up from the chat box uh, if you think anything sure. important sure. Uh, you want to respond sure. there's a very good question wild flowers fires in australia from anindita mukhopadhyay everyone and prof mukhopadhyay asked about the answer yeah no it's on fires in australia they make us gasp in horror are there shifts in perception think of pandavas and burning of khandava forest to feeding agni how would you define this shift you know on australia there's fascinating work there is a lot of work by scholars who show that australia the first humans get there 50000 year years ago the aborigines their impact is very real in the long term many of the large mammals died out but certainly the use of fire they were able to use fire in a very controlled manner and this huge kinds of fires we see in the modern period because the end of the earlier fire stick farm the fire stick farming was able to control large fires by burning small controlled fires so i think the recent industrial transformation of australia and its landscape has a very major role in the scale of the fires so there's much more to learn from those earlier cultures in a very creative and thoughtful manner so whether that will happen i don't know another very interesting question globalization during the colonial era has brought together well basically it's arguing that in the colonial era there's globalization and bringing together the world of course there is and i think that just as there is work on pax britannica and the great european empires there's now a lot of very good work on the unsaid informal empire not through territorial conquest but through economic dominance of the united states and a remarkable book whose title alone should be quoted 
it was such a good book that after the 1000 page version came and sold well author decided to write a 200 page version which of course has sold even better it's called insatiable appetite the american impact on the tropical world so the appetite for rubber the appetite for coffee for fruits such as bananas hmm? how it transformed large parts of the tropical world for tea for coffee so definitely there is a different kind of rhythm and pace in a more globalized world but global contact is not all new and if we start debating globalization we'll have a big debate about whether it got a big kick start in 1991 end of the cold war 1945 the end of the world wars and the beginning of a era of unprecedented economic growth for 30 years or should we go back to the 19th century and steamship navigation and railways or should we go as donald wooster suggests to 1492 when the americas were economically integrated with the so called old world and the resources of this vast area was opened up should we go back to the coming of uh, 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 agriculture in many parts of the world this is a large debate but i do think that this modern era is distinctive it is different in terms of the rhythms in terms of the scale in terms of the sheer size of the impact and the coming of modern technical industrial civilization particularly i think post 45 is a very different place. but we can save that one hour there is another question um, uh, could you elaborate more this is a question from near the gangwar could you elaborate more on historical or literary references to the expression of the dignity or agency of rivers and animals ah oh, there is a vast literature on this and this literature is not only there in asian societies many people here may have seen the films of you know the great wizard harry potter and you may remember in one of the instances he meets his father who is across a lake the father comes in the form of a deer with shining antlers this is a very famous uh, instance in lot of medieval accounts of the hunt in europe the hunter gets lost from the main party goes into a part of the forest and comes across a river Uh, a deer, a vast stag, a huge stag, who has these shiny antlers. This stag is the is the symbol of divinity. For Christians, it is Christ. For the non-Christians, it is the divine. Actually, there's something else happening there. The wilderness, not just the forest, the desert, is a place where the human is supposed to experience the divine. A Cronin has a remarkable essay in which he argues how many of the religions, the wilderness is a place where, in coming in touch with the natural elements, you also come in touch with the inner self. so the animal as a mirror of the human is very common in literature and i think there's a remarkable work on sanskrit tamil pali uh, farsi uh, which which shows this and there are certain animals one of the reasons i'm fascinated by the elephant is because the elephant quite early on is seen as an animal capable of deep emotion many emotions associated with humans grief uh, the longing for the beloved believe it or not no whether the elephant felt this i don't know authors were saying this. so give a famous example well known there is uh, akbar's conquest of deccan one elephant is taken i think from bijapur there are two elephants or a couple and one elephant is taken away so the other elephant is supposed to compose poems uh, of separation now here the elephant is a metaphor of the human but of course there is and i think that there is a very powerful anti hunting ethic in lot of the writing in literature and in lot of the verse many of the jatakas celebrate and the panchatantra many of you will know the story of the three animals who collaborated against the hunter you know the animals keep changing sometimes it is a turtle a crow and a deer that's the most famous one there is a net and then you know one of them pecks the hunter and that this is an allegory these are three animals who are collaborating and living peacefully there is a remarkable work actually to me the most, some of the most remarkable work by the great historian uma chakravarti she wrote a very famous paper on androgynous animals and other beasts and there she contrasts the community of carpenters who lives within it close to elephants in a forest with the king and of course the carpenter's relationship with the animals is very harmonious while the king's is very negative oh, you have to be careful here the carpenters after all are chopping up trees the trees also are home to certain animals but there are different levels of conflict the levels of conflict of the carpenter is much less than that of the king so there's abundant writing and we can debate and discuss this about i think it's a very good question okay uh, mahesh do you think any other important question otherwise we will end it here pangya there is a question on youtube i think uh, can you read it out for just mahesh? one second yeah, mahesh this is a question from barbara harris 
Professor Rangarajan, thank you very much. Why has the dollar valuation of nature become hegemonic? What are the scientific dangers and social evils of so-called natural capital? So this is the question from Barbara Harris. Sorry, could you just say it again? I couldn't catch all of it. Just the question. Sorry, uh, why has... Yeah, your voice was not clear. Why has the dollar variation of nature become hegemonic? What are the scientific dangers and social evils of so-called natural capital? So she was asking a dollar variation of nature become hegemonic. Why it, it has you know, taken place? That's the question. It's a large question. I, I, I don't have a one line answer. I'm always hesitant to give monocausal explanations. Uh, it's much easier to look at this in a specific time and place. And uh, w one of the very important elements, I think, is the coming of fossil capital. Uh, once the enormous energy in the coal and oil and gas is released, it, it, it transforms not so much the human nature relationship, but the power of some men over other men. So rather than go with a very fine scholar, Professor Dipesh Chakrabarti, who says the Anthropocene as a time when we should only write history of humans versus nature, because humans, with whatever our differences, stand in a dominant relationship with nature. And I'd go with uh, many of the other historians, particularly Germans, who have critiqued this and argued that those who controlled capital and technology had much more control over humans and nature. So the persons, you know, there's a very famous uh, Victorian uh, song which said, we have the maxim gun and they don't. And uh, there is a book called Tentacles of Progress. And the author Hedrick argued, we had the steamship and they didn't. I mean, you, you get what I'm arguing that I think it is not a coincidence that the most powerful countries are the ones who have the technology and the capital. And this should not just be applied across countries. It should be applied across different sections of society, different classes, if you will. Not so much only in terms of the old notion of capital. In terms of capital, which is able to mobilize technology to transform nature into value. So that, I think, is a very, very important turning point. Other than that, my sense, and I'm going by a scholar I admire. He's not a historian. He was a very important ecologist and scientist, Barry Komenar. And Commoner argued that there's a very important set of technologies which came during and after the Second World War. These technologies were based on a certain model of linear change. And the way in which they achieved success made it inevitable that they would be an ecological failure. One of the instances he gave is of the internal combustion engine. Now, he's not saying there shouldn't be internal combustion engine, not that at all. But the principle of the internal in combustion engine is to maximize conversion of fossil fuel energy into other forms of energy, for instance, for locomotion, for movement, for haulage. But integral to that process, I repeat, integral to that process is the idea that there is no such thing as waste. And the products which then become part of the natural cycle rather than mimicking nature's cycle, are inverting it. So commoner argued very simply that there's no such thing as waste. All things are interconnected. Everything goes somewhere. Nature knows best. And he argued that a lot of modern technology is built in a way that it will be an ecological thing. And he then argued that you need technologies which are more cyclical. And for this, of course, you need a larger societal shift. So I'm not answering her question, but I'm just reflecting on it. That there are these two big shifts. One is fossil fuel energy, which of course was uneven. We know the industrial okay. revolution. Okay. Was okay. Yes. I think uh, we shall uh, end it here. Uh, is there anything? Uh... <clears throat> okay. I think uh, we'll uh, end here. There must be some more questions. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mahesh, uh, for the you know, wonderful you know, lecture. I request uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Vargis, to uh, propose you know, a formal worth of tank. Vargis. Yeah. Um, just uh, for the formality, and you know, thank you so much, uh, <coughs> Professor Makesh Rangarajan, for accepting our invitation and be here. I remember you said uh, when you came in 2015, that you want to come often to Hyderabad. And this time we are lucky to have you virtually. And 
we hope that you know, you would be coming back to us to see the lush uh, campus and leave the campus uh, again. Uh, but thank you so much. It was uh, quite an enlightening uh, talk. You actually spoke about uh, you know, the diverse contestations across time as well as within the time. And it's the nature that we are actually uh, facing today. And thank you all uh, uh, for joining us this uh, session, which was uh, obviously a large number of people at the evening. Uh, thanks also to Pranay and uh, Arun for uh, the support that they have given. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. It's been a privilege and honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Okay, we thank you, Mahesh. Bye-bye.